Well, good morning, everybody. Can we make a start? Welcome to this Pathways to Net Zero Roundtable discussion. My name is Stephen Glaster from Imperial College and the LSE. Um, I'm chairing this morning. Can I just remind you of the rules? Um, please remember to mute your, your uh, microphone when you're not speaking and uh, use your raise hand function to alert me when you want to say something, but also if you can remember to take the hand down again afterwards. Um, I want to remind you that this session will be recorded and it's not Chatham House rule. So this recording will be available to general public at a later date. So please be aware of that. Um, and I now want to introduce Claire Haig, who is Chief Executive of Greener Visions. Claire. Thank you very much, Stephen. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to this second Pathways to Net Zero Roundtable discussion series. Um, my sincerest thanks first to go to, to Trueform for kindly sponsoring these roundtable discussions, to the Foundation for Integrated Transport for providing grant funding, and to the Greener Transport Council, without whose invaluable support this work would be possible. So we face an ever more challenging context for net zero. The Prime Minister has made clear that growth is going to be the central mission for the new government. And a review is underway to ensure that net zero is sufficiently pro-business and pro-growth. But how do we ensure that growth doesn't come at the expense of tackling climate change and what will the government's new priority mean for the levelling up agenda? Surely, surely at the, 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 focus ought, the focus should be on more focus on the greater distributional benefits of economic growth rather than fixation with a single GDP number. But above all, we cannot avoid any backsliding on decarbonisation. It's now or never if we're to tackle climate change. Our climate is heating up at great speed and our dependency on fossil fuels is not only at the root of the climate emergency, but is also fueling the cost of living and energy security crises. Successive UK governments have failed to grasp the nettle on energy demand reduction and the lack of significant energy efficiency measures, um, despite the jaw-dropping commitment to freeze energy bills for the next two years at a cost of some 150 billion is staggering. One might even say reckless in the face of warnings of possible blackouts this winter. So today we will focus on how we can develop solutions to the cost of living crisis that will accelerate the transition to net zero and enhance our energy security. You might be wondering why there is no mention of transport specifically in the discussion points for this session. Transport is, after all, the fastest growing source of global greenhouse gas emissions. However, whilst many of the solutions we will discuss are likely to include transport in some way, the key conclusion from the Pathways to Net Zero's research is that we need a whole systems transition to net zero and a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about decarbonizing transport. A technology-led approach has delivered very little progress since 1990. Vehicle efficiency gains have been eroded as people have driven more and in larger vehicles. Transport is famously a derived demand, and we cannot think properly about decarbonizing transport without also considering all the factors that give rise to all the passenger and freight trips that make transport the biggest polluting sector of the UK economy. The urgency of the climate crisis also requires us to look for the big policy levers that are likely to deliver, to deliver the biggest emissions reductions in the shortest time possible. So how can we use pricing and the wider system of taxation, incentives and fiscal measures to accelerate the transition to net zero? Last week, the IMF called on governments around the world to develop credible and irreversible policies to achieve net zero, saying that decades of procrastination have transformed what should have been a smooth transition into what is likely to be a more challenging one. Why have we seen decades of procrastination? 
How can we change the thinking of decision makers? What in our own thinking needs to change? The electoral cycle presents inbuilt challenges, but short-termism is a major obstacle for achieving net zero across the board and affects the behavior of consumers, businesses, and politicians alike. So how can we move from short-term thinking to a systemic long-term approach to tackling climate change? How can we ensure that net zero is at the heart of policy making? And how can, we, how can we develop, use energy demand reduction to deliver not only solutions to tackling the climate, but also the cost of living and energy security crises? So these are just some of the questions that we will explore today. Thank you all very much for joining and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Now, um, I should have mentioned that we have apologies from Peter Jones, who's not well. Uh, and in addition to the list that I think he will have received, we have, we welcome Leanne Daniels. And I think Gillian Animal will be joining us at some point. I don't see she's here yet, but hopefully she'll come and join us very soon. Now, it's uh, six months since the last time we did this, and quite a lot's happened since. Um, the overall impression I took away from the sessions um, we had then was this, this uh, feeling that the government had expressed, well, that, that government expressed lots of fine intentions, but really wasn't doing very much, um, and being, not being clear about how we were going to progress from where we were then to net zero. Um, I asked um, Steve Gooding if he'd be kind enough to open up with a little bit of an um, overview of what's happened between then and now, and to set the stage for us. Steve. Thanks, Stephen. Well, I guess I'd be astonished if any of us on this panel or anyone on the call wasn't aware of the three really big things that have happened uh, in that timescale that we're talking about. Of course, there was the sad death of Her Majesty the Queen and the accession of King Charles. Um, potentially there, uh, the loss of quite a loud voice uh, on the environmental campaigning front. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Second, of course, has been the ongoing tragedy of the war in the Ukraine, which appears, if anything, to be getting even more serious as each day ticks by with the launch of attacks just this morning on Kyiv itself the destruction of the bridge over the weekend. So a lot to worry about there. And of course, the ramifications of that for the supply of traditional fossil fuels, of which Russia was a major exporter, uh, which has particularly hit countries on mainland Europe. Germany, I think, in particular, has suffered on uh, gas exports from Russia, but is having uh, a ripart effect uh, that's affecting us as well. Um, and uh, I think we should also, in that context, uh, have in our minds that the oil producing exporting countries at the instigation, I think, of uh, Saudi Arabia have uh, decided to limit oil production with the aim of pushing the barrel price up, um, which has uh, rather flown in the face of what the American presidency was hoping. Uh, but all of this is combining to create a problem both of a shortage of supply and an upward pressure on price for traditional fossil fuels. And then domestically, uh, we have, I guess we'd say two things here really, but one obviously is the uh, accession of Liz Truss to become our Prime Minister and Kwasi Kwarteng Chancellor, and the now, I think, probably infamous mini budget that we're all still slightly reeling from and the financial markets took against. Um, but it comes, they're, they're taking over, comes at a time of great pressure on household budgets. So what we have is an, a problem with energy prices that is part of the problem that many households are facing with uh, steep inflation uh, and a reduction in real terms household income, which is also hitting uh, on the debate about benefits and benefits indexation. And we have Liz Truss, whose uh, mantra is growth, growth, growth. 
And she said as much at the Tory party conference, and she's very clear about it. And it's in that context, the last thing I'd say by way of background, that we know that the Bay's Secretary of State, Jacob Rees-Mogg, has appointed Chris Skidmore to chair a, a, a review looking at, uh, and I've, I've written it down here, a review to ensure delivering the net zero target does not place undue burdens on businesses or individuals. And that review is due to report by the end of this year. And I think what's particularly interesting for the purposes of today's conversation is that the review doesn't question the target itself, doesn't question the ambition to get to net zero, but it is very much about how can it be done in a way that supports the growth agenda? Um, how can it be done in a way that avoids uh, what's described here as undue or unnecessary burdens? So wherever we look at the moment, we're going to be seeing, uh, does this support the growth agenda? If not, why are we doing it? And I said that would be the last thing, but I will add one more, which is, of course, that in that famous mini budget, we saw a government ambition to accelerate infrastructure spending in which there were 86 road schemes, roughly half of which, just over half of which, and I think it's also important to log, are um, safety schemes. So there is a, an ambition to invest. It's not just on additional capacity, but we're certainly seeing a desire for additional road capacity uh, and if, where it's going to be generated, for it to be generated quickly. And the Lower Thames Crossing and Stonehenge Tunnel were both on that list. And we noted that within a matter of days, if not hours, of the new ministerial team arriving in the DFT, National Highways was out there placing the contracts uh, for the uh, construction of the Stonehenge Tunnel scheme. So Stonehenge, I pick out as well as Lower Thames is quite totemic of a, uh, an intention uh, to crack on, not just with improving the efficiency of the national road network, including its safety, but also to add capacity where there are uh, constraints, problems, or in the case of Stonehenge, um, a national international heritage site that needs protecting from traffic. That's what I would say uh, by way of backdrop, Stephen. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, is it fair to say that uh, one sensed, it just in terms of the general philosophy that the new government and its supporters um, have, have been showing, um, a slight turn in that, uh, the, 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 as you say, the, the pushes for growth, and that somehow is much more important than um, than carbon reduction, and that carbon reduction is something we can leave to another day in a way that um, it, it wasn't six months ago. Is, is that, I mean, that's, that's, obviously that's an expression of uh, a, a view about the, the way people are thinking at the moment. Now, I, got, I certainly got that sense. And there was some, one or two um, slightly snide comments about, to the effect that people who were, um, interested in, in um, the environment and so forth were enemies of growth uh, um, at, at the moment. Is that fair or not, do you think? Well, um, I, I think um, I'm, I'm almost certain that you're speaking to us from the, the epicentre of the enemies of growth, which I think the Prime Minister described as um, North, North London folk who spend their days waiting for a cab to take them it, to the BBC indeed, studios. Indeed, I, I am in an Islington town, townhouse, yes. So, uh, and I have been sent a taxi by the BBC to go into the Speak to the Day programme in the past. Absolutely. So um, I think you're right. So just as the 2010 government in its early days published a document, the, uh, the coalition uh, statement, which said just inside the front cover, let's be clear, everything we do plays second fiddle to paying down the deficit. Now, two things about that. One is it was very clear, and certainly those of us who were in the transport department or in any, any kind of senior role meeting the new ministers, they were very clear. We are going to spend less money and uh, we're going to cancel some schemes and 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 uh, because we've got to do something about this deficit that we've inherited. Uh, was one thing. And the other thing, of course, is that by 2015, they'd pretty much forgotten that. Um, now, whether that was because they felt uh, they'd been so successful in paying it down or whether um, 
politics and events dear boy uh, had caused a change of mindset but i think in much the same way we heard uh, many things from the previous conservative administration we heard a great deal uh, about leveling up for example i don't recall hearing anything uh, about leveling up in the last uh, 10 days or so uh, may maybe it's still there but i think it will be playing second fiddle to a generalized push for growth and as i said in the context of the Skidmore review, I don't think this administration is turning its back on the carbon agenda, but I don't think it's got it front and center of its mind. Um, front and center of Liz Truss's mind is, how am I going to grow the economy? Because let's be clear, if she can't grow the economy, Kwasi Kwarteng is not going to be able to balance the books. And even if we can grow the economy, that's an open question, but that's for another day, yeah. And if um, if I were to say, uh, in answer to the question po um, um, posed on un the undue burden, well, just go and look at what the Climate Change Committee and Lord Deben had available, um, let's say, a year ago, and that, that's the answer to the question. Would that be simple-minded? I mean, that, that was essentially a question that they addressed, I thought. Um, Here's, here's a net zero target. Here are the ways we can get there. Um, and there are burdens, but we don't think they're insuperable. I mean, in, in, wasn't that what they were saying then? Well, I'd, I'd roll us back, and uh, you and I will remember this very clearly, Stephen. I'd roll us back to the Nick Stern uh, review, yeah. uh, which pretty much did the same thing. And yeah. the business case for acting isn't based on a um, will this be imposing uh, burdens or not imposing burdens? It's if you don't do this, the burden you face will be worse. So, you know, uh, a pessimist might say we're, we're going for the least worst option, but it is the least worst. And yes, there are going to be burdens. But I think, you know, sort of rolling into the, the conversation that Claire invited us to face here, it is going to be incredibly difficult for a government to use price signals to achieve its ambitions if those price signals involve things becoming even more expensive at a time where affordability for households and for businesses has become a, a critical issue and nowhere more so than on energy prices where British business, and I'm thinking particularly because I've heard it over and over from the automotive sector, um, our energy prices are high by global standards uh, in uh, in fueling uh, manufacture. And if that's the case, um, they've got momentary respite because the pound is at a, a low, particularly against the dollar. But uh, you know, quite again, how that balances out, you know, to an extent, the, the poor exchange rate that hits us if we're going away for a holiday benefits uh, businesses on their competitivity if they're exporting and of course the British auto industry is heavily skewed towards export um, but those energy prices are going to hurt and what you might otherwise do to persuade people to consume less energy and to become more energy efficient would be to put the price up well I think uh, this government is going to find that extremely hard yeah uh, at the same time uh the basic message of uh, the Climate Change Committee and Stern was, uh, if we're serious about doing, getting to net zero, there will be some sacrifice to be made. And sooner or later, you're gonna to have to get your head out of the sand and, uh, and, and recognize that. But I, of course, I take the point that it's, it's not made easier by what's happened more recently. And I think there are things that also are saying where um, there are things that you can be spending your money on um, which will help with the growth agenda and uh, the climate agenda. So the most obvious one, I, I think that, again, everyone on this call will be very familiar with, would be home insulation. Um, uh, our houses have not been very well designed and built for many, many years. If you compare um, how our houses are with, say, uh, those in Scandinavia, uh, it is inconceivable, I think, to people in Sweden and uh, Norway and the like, that we would still be building wooden framed, not terribly good double glazed windows, uh, houses with uh, gas fired heating and all of those things. Um, there are things that can be done and in particular, not just to think about new homes, but to think about what can be done, for example, to places 
gosh, plucking one from the air, where there might be uh, long terraces of Victorian properties, um, where there is there is much that can be done to make those homes um, better insulated, um, which would be a good way of pumping some money into the economy and getting some useful uh, investment done. And I think that's helpful. And one of the things we should keep in mind throughout today's session, I think, is the extent to which the increase in the cost of energy has changed the economic viability of things like that. I mean, it's fundamentally much more worthwhile to the private individual than it was to do that kind of thing. I think a wonderful example um, over the weekend was the thought that the oil company, the energy companies themselves, uh, are suggesting that they might pay people not to consume energy at, at the peak, so they don't have to burn very expensive oil at the peak. Um, and that's a wonderful example of how the price system can give incentives to completely transform people's behaviour and get a much better outcome all, all around, it seems to me. So they, they wouldn't have thought of that, of course, if the price of oil wasn't a lot higher. Then the other thing to, for me to, to think about throughout the piece is, should we be thinking in advance about what might happen if and when the world price of oil drops? Because it will, I'm sure, put it this way, it's a, it's a, it's a possibility, as it always has done as the world economy adjusts, hope for the, the uh, situation in Ukraine is resolved, price of oil can drop very quickly. Uh, and that will create maybe opportunities in policy terms to, as it were, step in and um, do something with the margin. If, if you follow me, people have got used to higher prices. That gives the opportunity to step into the policy to, to put something in there which wasn't there before. Thank you. Any other comments on that background piece before I move on? Uh, feel free to put your hand up. No? Okay. Um, so uh, Steve, Stephen, yes, I've, I've, um, I've put hand my up. hand up. Stephen. Yeah, hello. Sorry, I missed it. Go ahead, Stephen Joseph. Yes. Um, this is this was um, following Steve's um, uh, very good outline. Um, I just wanted to, before we get uh, into the general, um, into the discussion, just say um, what that means in practice for what our audience is for this, uh, who we're talking to. Because actually, I mean, what uh, Steve has been talking about is yeah, the current government, but actually reading any of the opinion polls, um, we ought now to be talking to the opposition parties and actually their approach to this is very different. Um, you know, Treasury in particular, the <coughs> shadow Treasury team have a very different approach to net zero. Um, Ed Miliband has been out there with some very clear policies and um, it seems to me that um, rather than um, just looking at what the current government might be doing, we ought to be talking about the political class as a whole and um, what we say um, uh, address uh, to them about this. So that doesn't necessarily change the questions that we've got in front of us, but it does, I think, possibly change um, the nature of the discussion a bit. Um, I, I don't know what you think about that, Stephen. I, I think. Yeah, I, of course, that's an excellent point. And um, further to that, it's, our audience has always been uh, the thinking general public. It's all, it's all about, as it were, the, uh, the broad swell of, of public opinion that we, we need to influence, as well as individual political parties, of course. Yeah, but it's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, now look, uh, what I propose to do is to go down the list that you have uh, in your brief, I think, um, in order, uh, giving each of you uh, a three minute opportunity to to make whatever points you want to make. And perhaps, as it seems appropriate, after each, uh, we'll have a, a couple of minutes to um, discuss points of order. And then after all of that, we can have a, a general discussion. So um, starting with Paul Campion. Off you go. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> So as I was thinking about this, I was thinking we've got a scale problem here. We're constantly flipping between uh, an existential crisis and then the need for personal action. This is an inherently political small p uh, problem because it's about the way that uh, we change 
our own behaviours, but in the context of complex societies which are difficult and uh, uh, slow to change. Um, and we've got a, 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 uh, a big dichotomy. I think as, as professionals in the area, we can all see that uh, not only must the change happen, but in many ways it has already started. And we can see that there is no possible way that we can go back. There is no past state that we can return to where everyone is happy uh, with the status quo. Um, not, of course, that anyone ever, ever has been happy with the status quo. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps to rather grandly quote Gramsci, the old world is dead and the new world is struggling to be born. And uh, I think I'm... Uh, I feel that uh, I'm going to be saying the thing that I sometimes feel I'm, I'm always saying, which is as technocrats, we've got to be really clear that uh, uh, our role is vitally important to come up with solutions, to come up with answers to the problems. But just coming up with an answer to the problem, just coming up with a solution doesn't necessarily make anything happen. And as we engage on this scale problem, we have to find high level narratives, we're going to find stories that enable people to understand why and how they can live in the new world that we can build. And we're going to be very conscious at all times that we, we don't uh, present our technocratic solutions as self-evidently good and then get puzzled when people don't immediately go for them. Uh, uh, it's a topic we discussed in similar in, uh, 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 forums before. In my local area, there is a current plan to fund some quite dramatic and, in my view, uh, not altogether bad changes to the transport system with some road user charging to, uh, uh, to use a, a, a perhaps rather emotional um, um, phrase. <clears throat> There's already a petition with 20,000 names um, saying that that's a bad thing. A perfect example of a solution which probably works within the parameters set for it, uh, but it is not linked to a higher narrative and is going to struggle to motivate people to change. So this scale problem, how do we recognise the overarching problem? How do we come up with solutions and how do we link it to personal uh, uh, circumstances in a way that can motivate uh, this complex society to move as one, I think is the central challenge. Thank you. Uh, and I think you call that leadership, don't you? Uh, of some kind. <laughs> it, it, it's a slightly old fashioned, out of date concept there, Steve. And I, 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 I barely can remember what you're talking about, but I, I think you're probably right. But it's uh, to state the obvious, it's leadership based on appreciation of the facts and the science and not not uh, sort of guesswork and, and believing that what you'd like to be true is actually true. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 note, I note in the papers today, there's talk of banning the uh, um, solar panels on farmland. Uh, it's a perfect example of uh, some sort of narrative um, uh, acting against uh, not only the uh, my view that the wider priorities but even against the narrative the story that is currently being politically pushed um so you know, on the one hand we mustn't be a nanny state on the other hand you're not allowed to do that with your farmland because we say so and 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 so uh, finding ways to connect this you know again it's a scale problem uh it is the it's the central challenge yeah thank you um no hands up i see so i'll move on to philip selwood Okay, thank, thanks very much, Stephen, uh, and thanks to Steve for the uh, excellent outline. I just wanted to throw something in uh, which hasn't been mentioned yet, but I think is going to be absolutely central, is absolutely central to the delivery of net zero, as opposed to the ideological discussions that we can all get endlessly fascinated by. And that's the role of the private sector, because it was interesting, Stephen Joseph was, was saying, you know, who are our audience? And there's no doubt that the, the political class are a key audience for this agenda. But I think 
the the reality is is that it's going to be the market that is going to actually deliver this um and i think we sometimes either dive down um as paul says into individual behaviors or we bang on the door of government and say you must do more the reality is i would quite like to see the government do uh, more but in a very focused way but i would like then to see um the power of the market really being uh, enhanced because that's the opportunity we've talked and it's my sort of special subject i guess about energy efficiency when you when you think about energy efficiency um just imagine what opportunities that already presents for the market in terms of jobs in terms of leveling up in terms of social cohesion better health outcomes um i find it quite extraordinary frankly that in the face of uh, all of the evidence that we know about not just domestic but also industrial and commercial energy efficiency that the government feels that they're not able to spend 15 million pounds uh, on a on a public education uh, campaign for instance when only this morning jan rosano was uh, speculating that uh, for 15 million pounds that probably would uh, return 65 times uh, in 18 months um so there's some massive opportunities for the for the private sector, whether it's in energy, whether it's in uh, transport, because at its heart, we talk about a net zero transition. This is an energy transition. And I just wanted to quote in, in finishing this little piece, my favorite physicist, uh, Robert Ayers, and he reminds us that, and I quote, the economic system looking forward is essentially a system of transport transforming energy resources into energy products and services. This represents the most major economic transformation in the last 200 years. And that to me is where we need to be really pushing. And I, I'm hopeful Stephen Joseph is right that, that, that a different government, uh, regardless of color, has a different approach to this uh, agenda, but whether they do or they don't, I think we absolutely have to get behind um, the private sector and, and the market in order to deliver this going forward. I'm not saying solely that because there are many people who have different views about it. But I think unless we can harness that to its full potential, then I think we'll be really, really struggling to make that transition um, uh, in terms of actual action on the ground. So that was, that was my sort of first interruption or uh, provocation, Stephen. Thank you, Philip. I, I personally do so agree with that. Um, we see progressively all governments seeming to think they've got to do it all themselves and they, they, they're going to do it all by direction um, yeah. when they can't. And what they can much better do, as you say, is get the, get the incentives right and the prices right and the taxes right and then let it, uh, let it sort itself out. But I, I so, so agree. Any comments on that? Okay, um, next, uh, Philip, um, sorry, Greg, Greg Marston. Thanks, Stephen. Um, well, we're already at that point where some of the things that you want to say have already been, <laughs> been said, which is not surprising given the people on the call. But um, so, yeah, I, d I definitely share um, Stephen's view that, you know, 18 months or so we'll have a different politics. Um, and I think actually one of the things that we desperately need to see if we're going to have a um, the kind of scale of change that, that, that we have to have is a rebirth of the public demand for action that we had pre-COVID. Um, you know, the, there were mass demonstrations on, on the streets of our towns and cities and that's kind of disappeared. Uh, and I think there are some obvious crossovers between the cost of living and decarbonisation. So finding ways of re-sparking that public debate is is critical um but that's 18 months or so we haven't got 18 months to wait so i think we have to focus on what can be pragmatically achieved with this government in the short run so in terms of the growth agenda we're well, clearly pursuing the investments on electrification pushing the um, trials of hgb technologies the things that we know we need in the long term that might fit with the agenda of the day um, let's get on with those and get them um, get them underway. Um, I mean, from a carbon perspective, obviously, uh, cost of living is going to significantly impact on consumption. 
and that's going to push down carbon emissions. So it's not a progressive uh, set of policies, but I suppose from a, from a carbon perspective, it maybe buys us a little bit of breathing room that the kind of thinking in, in central government wouldn't um, create at the moment. Um, I totally agree with, with Philip on the importance of, of businesses. Um, if we want to be both pro-growth and, and tackle carbon, you know, all the, all the businesses that I interact with have set their own target year for net zero. Um, what, do they, what do they need to change to bring this about? There's never been enough money in the public sector to resolve all of that anyway. So, you know, can local authorities work with businesses to deliver lower carbon travel to work, to access their businesses or travel for business? You know, how, how can we have better partnerships between industry and the rail sector, for example? Um, and, you know, we, we've still got uh, weekday travel six to seven percent below pre-pandemic levels. It's even more than that still in the peak, um, you know, despite the fact that there's a lot more traffic out there than there was 12 months ago. Um, you know, so we haven't returned to the office and there are still opportunities uh, to capitalise a little bit more on those kinds of things that can still be pro-growth. Um, I very much doubt that it's going to be possible to massively accelerate the roads programme, given the contentiousness of the cases that are being brought forward. It wouldn't take too much to drag some of these schemes uh, back beyond the 18 month period anyway. So I think it's it's almost folly to try and accelerate some of the things that they're, they're trying to do. Um, but I would like to see the DFT's feet being held to the fire on the case for investments in a world where we've got radically higher fuel prices at the moment. Um, we've got a cost of living crisis. Um, you know, what does that do for, for demand futures? Um, and in particular, I'd like to see National Highways press. This, they still have no programme on addressing car occupancy levels uh, or promoting um, public transport. And I think that's, you know, getting better use of the existing network is not just about putting new signs up. It's also about getting actual better use of the network. Uh, and then finally, um, difficult to deliver perhaps, um, but I'd like to see uh, lower price and capped um, public transport fare experiments being continued. I mean, how much is this really costing us? It seems to be bringing people um, back to bus uh, and that's something we need in the longer run. It addresses the cost of living crisis to some degree. So, um, you know, can we get the evidence out there quickly and get that supported? Uh, and although I started with what we can get done in the short run, um, it's also important, I guess, for the pro-growth agenda, not to forget things like gear change, active travel England, which again, things we can get done in the short run, but might not necessarily be number one on the priority list for the government. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, a couple of things there. Uh, I absolutely agree about holding the government's feet to the fire, about doing what I call project appraisal, generally speaking. I mean, I, I don't know if others agree, but it looks to me that um, irrespective of which government stays in power, there is going to be a period where public funds, especially public capital funds, are in fact, in practice, going to be very, very short indeed. They uh, much less available than they have been in the past. And therefore it becomes doubly important that the government actually spends money on the things that are gonna work, whatever it is they wanna do. Um, that applies for the growth agenda. The government, if they really want to stimulate growth, they have to put money into projects which will actually produce growth. And similarly on, um, on carbon reduction. And to go back to something I said earlier, it just, just thinking something will work without doing the, the, uh, the research on why it might work is a terrible waste when you're so short of funds, I would have thought. Um, and just a, another reaction to what you opened up with, you, you said that there was a lot of public demand for action before um, the new government came into uh, existence. Do you, is that really true? Is, I mean, there, there might have been a few people in the street, but if you talk about the general public, what, is there, was there really a strong public demand for action on net zero? I think pre-COVID, it's easy to forget. Um, there, there were big demonstrations in towns and city centres. Extinction Rebellion was bringing various things to a halt. The profile of it was really quite different to, to where we are now. And, and I think, you know, 
whether it's how widespread it is, um, you know, if you look at the polls, they all suggest that people find it important. Um, you know, that's not the same as people being out on the street. But I think given the sorts of change that, we, that we're talking about in order to get on a net zero pathway, without creating that kind of level of public demand for change, some of the difficult policies that we might talk about doing here are just not, you know, not going to get close to being on the agenda. So, you know, it's, I think it's an interesting time because it's a turbulent political time. And I think there is a space for, for a different kind of demand from the public on, on this, whether that comes about or not, I don't, I don't know. And as part of our mission, presumably to try and inform the public a bit more and to get them to take the whole subject more seriously and get yeah, fired up about it. Yeah, yeah. Now, do feel free to raise a hand if you want to come in. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to Lauren Palmer. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think just coming back on that uh, point, I think public support for pursuing net zero is still high. Um, despite the cost of living crisis, you know, people know that this needs to happen. I think what they're worried about is how they're going to afford it. There's definitely a lack of understanding um, by the public about the cost of the net zero transition and the future impact on their energy bills and energy security. But, you know, the longer we put this investment off, the more expensive it's going to be to complete and it's going to increase the urgency with which actions needed. Scrapping previous climate policies and slowing decarbonisation is estimated by Carbon Brief to have increased energy bills by about £2.5 billion since 2013. And I think mixed messages on the direction of travel also impact on private sector investor confidence uh, as well in net zero. I also think mainstream media actually isn't always particularly helpful, so I'd, I'd reference the recent misquoting of the REC report into the cost of electricity versus petrol costs um, that said they were broadly equal based on, uh, I think, electricity at rapid power, uh, rapid fueling stations, and that led to a drop in electric car advert views on auto trade of about 20%. Decarbonisation is a really complex case to make to the public. There's definitely still an upfront cost gap in transport and in other sectors such as energy efficiency, retrofitting. But, you know, we know that electric vehicles have got lower fuel costs still, despite recent rises, and energy efficient homes will cost less to heat. So I think this is where private sector finance solutions can have a role in, in spreading that upfront cost or through linking financial products to future energy savings and in sending demand signals to scale up supply of energy efficient measures. Some of those practical solutions already exist. So salary sacrifice for electric vehicles, for example, is an affordable way for company employees to access an EV, but government benefit in kind rates are now only out till 2025. So any employer looking to provide a, a four year car lease to their employees can't guarantee how much it will cost either them or their employee in tax and national insurance after the first two years which creates nervousness. So we need that policy certainty to enable that product to continue. And then at the GFI on energy efficiency, we're looking at a, to bring private sector in, to look, uh, we're looking at a property linked finance solution. So how can, um, it's a financial instrument that allows homeowners to fund up to 100% of your upfront costs of energy efficient improvements linked to the property so that the repayment obligation transfers to subsequent homeowners. So if you are thinking of moving in the next three years, right now you wouldn't do those energy efficiency measures because you're not going to see that repayment in your energy bills. And this is designed to overcome that. It's been really successful in other countries, in particular in the USA, where PACE has supported around $10 billion of investment into energy efficiency measures. And then finally, I think just coming back to media, I saw a cartoon over the weekend on the front page of the Telegraph of a car salesman holding a candle over an electric car during the sales process. That sort of thing just isn't helpful. And in reality, we know that vehicle to grid trials have shown that actually the UK's fleet of electric vehicles can act as a, as a battery load balance, you know, an electricity load balancing device, feeding energy back into the grid at peak times and absorbing the supply when it's there. I appreciate explaining the benefits of um, even smart meters is, is difficult to consumers, including my own parents who seem to think it will cost them a lot more on energy if they have one. Um, never mind vehicle to grid, but actually energy companies such as Octopus are looking at how those price levers can be used to change behaviour, and I think we need more of that. Um, but I think fundamentally we just need to crack on, because the longer we leave it, the harder it's going to get. Thank you. 
and that goes back to our earlier discussion about the need to to um, get the market to do our work for us, as it were. Um, I've always been uh, mystified by uh, people make, as you did, making the very um, sensible proposition that there is there's money to be made here if only people understood it, and yet. It, it doesn't take off like wildfire. You, you'd have thought that if, if there really were, and I don't, I'm not querying what you're saying, but it's just interesting that if there are these opportunities, why, why they don't, uh, you know, you, markets are very good at finding opportunities to arbitrage. Where there's, where there's money to be made, they will invest, you would have thought. What's the problem? What's the obstacle? Is it lack of public understanding? They understand mortgages. They respond quickly to changes in, in interest rates in, in mortgages, as we saw. Is it that the opportunities aren't that big or that they, the risks are too difficult to handle? I think it's a mix of things. I think there is a there's a, a lack of there's a lack of understanding, I think, about what some of these things are. So fundamentally, there's, there's still un, misunderstandings about electric vehicles and, and how much they do cost and what that looks like over the life and, and how long they'll last. Um, I think on on energy efficiency again, you know, are the is the demand there at the moment from consumers? Mm. I'm not sure because do they really understand what they need to what they need to do? So I think it's a bit of a mix. But you know, the money's there, and when we talk to investors, these are two transport and and homes are two sectors that they're really really keen to put their money into. In some instances, there's just not the pipeline of projects or customers for them to actually provide those products mm. to. Or the products aren't quite there that exist, but but the money is there. Meaning that there are people willing to invest and take the genuinely take the risks involved. I think at the moment it's perhaps they're not quite prepared to take the risks. Yeah. So that's when we're saying, well, how can we use you know public money more smartly to de-risk that private sector investment? So could government grants be used as guarantees rather than grants, for example, to to crowd in that investment? So that's interesting. It's oiling the wheels, as it were. The wheels are there, yeah. but, but you need some more. And, and what's your view of the state of play with the UK Infrastructure Bank, which I, I, I understood, and as far as I did understand it, to be very much along those lines that the government, uh, previous government now, we're going to put a significant amount of capital available to be lent, mainly to local authorities and others. But it, it is a lending operation to be repaid with a, some kind of a return, like the World Bank. But I haven't heard much from them. No, they're still resourcing up, I think, in terms of their banking team. So they're starting to make investments. Um, they, I was on a, I was at a conference last week and they said for public sector, they're going to be lending to local authorities at guilt plus 60 bits, I think, mm. um, as a replacement or alternative to the Public Works Loan Board. Um, they've also got, so I think they've got 10 billion of lending and 12 billion of guarantees or the other way around. They are still working out what that guarantee looks like and what their remit is. So I think we'll see more. They haven't yet employed all their banking teams, but they're, they're scaling up rapidly. Thank you. Helpful. Stephen, right. sorry, Stephen, yes. just, uh, just wanted to come in quickly, if I may. Tell it's on, yes. Sorry, just on your question about, so is the demand there? You know, are the jobs there? I mean, I think we've really got to start to call this out. Why is it that Germany, Italy with super bonus, US with um, PACE, uh, France with FAIR, all schemes that are actually delivering massive um, infrastructure development investment, mainly led by the private sector, but stimulated by the public sector? I, I think the answer is quite simple. If, if we do not have a consistent and con uh, continuous um, positive framework of policy. This is where government does have its role. Why would you, if you were a private investor, being asked to skill up and invest in your uh, domestic retrofit workforce or uh, training up new uh, mechanics to deliver electric vehicles? Um, why would you do that given the uh, ridiculously um, uh, incomplete nature of uh, policy and with the policy cliff edge that we consistently face. And it comes back to your earlier point, or I think uh, Greg's earlier point about leadership. There's the jobs are there, the people 
and the demand is there. That's being demonstrated everywhere else in the world. Why do we think we're so exceptional? We're just failing. That's the, that's the answer. And we need to really start to make that case because otherwise, why would the private sector uh, come into this space? And, and that's, that's really, I think we've got to call it out. Good point. So uh, your, your diagnosis is that, that uh, so my question was why, why these schemes don't take off on their own. Uh, it's the lack of a, of a predictable, trustworthy uh, policy context. And the history is full of schemes that have not lasted five minutes and people invested in it and then it's yeah. come to nothing. The average, the average time over the last two decades of a policy on energy efficiency, for instance, has been a little less than 18 months. Why would any investor invest on that basis? You've got to have a policy, probably led, as you say, by the uh, investment bank, that's talking about five or 10 year programs in order for, um, because there's a complete misalignment between the investment cycle of business and government policy. And until we can get a better alignment, and I mean alignment in terms of time taken, if, you're, if it takes you five years to invest up in some of these areas, and we haven't even touched on renewables, why, why, why do you think renewables has been so successful? Because basically they've had that certainty, they've not had that cliff edge policy. Um, and on decarbonized transport and energy efficiency, it's absolutely, as Steve was saying earlier, Steve Gooding, absolutely been bedeviled really since 2010. Thank you, that's an excellent point. And I would make the similar point about our policies on infrastructure investment generally. I mean, whatever you think the right scheme should be, it's never the same package more than a year or two. Um, okay, thank you, we'll log that one. Um, now, um, who is next? Um, Tony Duckenfield. We can't hear you. No, uh, Tony, I, I'm going to I'm going to move on and come back to you and, and give uh, Andrea Lee um, her chance, and I will come back to you next while you sort out your sound. Is that all right? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, OK. Andrew Lee. Hi, thanks, Stephen. And um, sorry, um, Tony, hope your sound uh, works soon. Um, yeah, I guess uh, just kind of reflecting on, on, on what's being said. Um, obviously, I'm going to try and bring in a little bit of the sort of air quality perspective uh, because of my uh, role working uh, within that sector. Um, but it's it, it does seem to be raising questions about um, government's ability to think long term, but also take action in the immediate. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy sometimes to set uh, very long term uh, goals such as net zero by 2050 and then um, leave actual action down the line. And, and so linking that back to the, the current cost of living crisis, which, you know, um, is a very short term um, immediate um, emergency that, that needs to be tackled now, but it obviously has its roots in, in very um, historical um, long-term um, issues that have been uh, causing um, you know, poverty and inequalities in our country for a very long time. Um, and you know, I think reflecting back on air pollution, we definitely see it as, as both the cause and a symptom of, of this of existing social and health inequalities. Um, and reflecting back on um, research that the University of West of England produced back in 2019, which um, highlighted the increase in injustice from road traffic related air pollution in the UK. And this was um, a study that was following on from a study that had been done a few decades before uh, and um, was looking to see whether things had improved since the early 2000s and actually found that it was getting worse. And there you've got um, uh, 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 findings of um, seeing that, um, you know, the poorest households in, in the UK on average uh, tend to own fewer uh, cars, they tend to own fewer um, diesel vehicles in particular, they tend to use their vehicles less um, than um, higher income households, but yet they tend to suffer um, higher levels of air pollution 
um, and therefore, um, you know, um, they are uh, contributing less to the problem, but suffering the impacts more. Um, and so, yeah, I, thinking about um, how this needs to be addressed, um, because, you know, I think everyone probably here understands the, the, the really um, severe impacts of um, of air pollution on people's health. Everyone here has probably heard um, of the case of uh, nine-year-old Ella Duke Debra, who um, sadly died in 2013 and was found to be the first person um, uh, where air pollution um, was a cause of death. Um, so that's obviously a very important uh, moral uh, reason to take action on things like uh, the climate emergency and um, the, the public health crisis caused by air pollution. There's also a very important economic um, argument as well uh, with the Royal College of Physicians um, a few years ago um, estimating that the social cost of air pollution to individuals and the health service is over 20 billion pounds a year. Uh, more recently, in 2019, CBI Economics calculated that 3 million working days are lost every year to air pollution through ill health. Um, but on the flip side, um, they've also calculated that a 1.6 billion annual economic benefit to the UK could be realised by meeting uh, much stricter World Health Organisation guidelines. So, um, so uh, I guess a lot of people have raised the issue of what if, if you know the need for a narrative and also questioning why governments aren't um you know thinking about uh, providing a more long-term uh context for all the policies that we we know need to be implemented um but it's it, yeah it raises the question of that not ta not acting to tackle these sort of public health emergencies caused by air pollution and the climate emergency does keep us in this vicious cycle where you know um some of the root causes of of of, of these uh, socio-economic inequalities and poverty that really will hinder our ability to grow. If, if people can't go to work because they're sick, then how are you going to have a growth agenda? Um, if if the NHS uh, keeps having uh, such a big burden on it from things like um, air pollution and uh, and, and other uh, public health issues you know, that's going to be a, an economic burden on, on society and the government has to pay for that somehow. So, um, yeah, I think if, we, if, if as part of this sort of um, uh, push for growth, we're not addressing uh, some of these root causes uh, that keep dragging us down, then are we really going to be able to uh, have, uh, yeah, the growth that the government at the moment is, is talking about? Um, and, just, and just lastly, I guess, um, just to summarize um quoting one of the many parents that we've talked to over the years who are really worried about how air pollution is affecting the, the health um rudy whose whose son um suffers with asthma and it's triggered by a lot of it by um road traffic pollution um once told us um a sort of analogy that she'd heard um whereby if you if you have a a sick goldfish in a uh, in a fishbowl full of dirty water you don't just give that uh, fish medicine uh, to make it feel better but you clean the water that it's in um, and I think that's the sort of the, the policy context that we have to give for the, for the sort of the long-term goals but also um, take um, that action in the immediate as well. Thank you. Now your, your concern with air quality and health we're concerned with carbon reduction and net zero. Um, I can imagine there are many fields, many examples where those two things do not conflict. But are there examples you're aware of where there is a flat contradiction between a concern with those two different things? Yeah, I mean, we saw it um, uh, very clearly with the uh, push for diesel uh, in the late 2000s and um, early 2010s. Um, and we've uh, hopefully, uh, well, some of us have learned a lesson from that. Um, there, there's certainly um, other areas such as um, in domestic heating with biomass and wood burning where we're seeing issues with that. I mean, I think there's increasing uh, suggestions from the climate change side that biomass is actually not great. 
uh, for, for net zero, but I, I think the, the jury's still out. Certainly from an air quality perspective, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just going to add to the uh, level of particulate matter in the air and cause a lot of problems. Um, so that's why, yeah, I think that it, there's a definite need to be addressing both these problems in um, together very much more comprehensively. Um, and there's also opportunities. I think um, we see that, um, that you know, those uh, a lot of people who aren't um, interested in climate change for whatever reason will understand the importance of protecting uh, public health or the health of their families much more, and will be much more motivated by that and, and can kind of see it. You know, everybody knows someone that has asthma. Everyone knows someone that has heart condition. People will know someone maybe that suffered a stroke, and these are all um, health impacts that are, are linked to. Um, air pollution and so I think it's a way of making it more tangible and more real and bringing those health impacts that are um, and those societal impacts that are going to happen as well or are happening from um, from climate change um, and climate and emergency um, more uh, yeah stronger and, and more real for people to um, demand and expect action. Thank you good and we note Steve Gooding's point that half the road schemes roundly in the current uh, plan are actually road safety schemes rather than anything else. So uh, that's a similar sort of uh, point, similar field. Tony Duckenfield, uh, are you with us? I might, can you hear me now? I can, yes, we can hear you, good. Go ahead. Fantastic, well, yes, <laughs> the IT have been doing pretty well up to all that point, haven't they? <laughs> um, so I'd um, just like to give a bit of context um, which is that um, go, back in the day, I was very involved with London congestion charging um, and I was responsible for um, assessing the economic uh, impacts of London congestion charging. Um, and so, you know, there's quite a lot of learning from that in terms of both successes for that and also the difficulties of introducing something like that. Uh, because, you know, as we know, nothing else, much else happened along those lines since then. We're still not, not much closer. Um, so partly because of that, um, I developed a, a, a solution for climate change, or partial solution at least, uh, at least a general climate levy. Um, so yes, using price to try and um, encourage people or get people to switch, uh, reduce their carbon use. Greg, Greg might remember this um, idea um, and use the, you know, sort of collect the revenue and use it for uh, mitigation purposes. I, I realized fairly quickly that um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and certainly not in the next couple of years, probably we we'll probably talk about 10 years off where anything like that can realistically be introduced. And that's just, we just can't wait that long. Um, so I came up with a, sh a short term solution, uh, which is carbon, personal carbon reduction planning. Um, and this um, is, I also learned from um, something called personal travel planning, personalized travel planning, which has been successful in the transport, um, in transport world for, you know, 10, 15 years, um, and they've actually managed to reduce, in the right context, right places, car, uh, car use by 10%. So I reckon that using the same kind of ideas and using, you know, sort of the latest uh, understanding from behavioral science and so on, uh, we can actually reduce people's carbon emissions by about 10% for those people that participate in the program. Um, that's, you know, I think that's a realistic uh, ambition. Um, it's not as much as we need, but at least it's something and it's a lot better than we're looking at at the moment. Um, so a couple of positive things are that um, I think 83% latest ONS survey, 83% of people are worried about climate change. So it doesn't mean to say they're doing anything about it, but it means if you approach them, they're probably receptive to, to at least listening to you. Um, as the point about air quality, actually, there's other, there's other reasons for wanting to reduce your carbon emissions, uh, improved air quality, improved health, um, reducing your energy costs. There's lots of different reasons why you'd be interested in participating in uh, in this program. Um, uh, one other thing we've just we've not mentioned at all is food, actually. So food is a big carbon generator. So that's another area where people can relatively easily make um, changes to their lifestyle. Um, and another positive thing actually is that over 300 local authorities have declared a climate emergency. And uh, there seems, be, seems to be a bit of a disconnect between local authorities and central government. But you know, a lot of local authorities are really interested in doing something, but to be honest, don't really know what to do and have really struggled to do anything. So this, this is an opportunity for local authorities to, um, to get involved and actually do something. 
Um, and then we talked about the private sector, so companies um, can also take part in this, this program. Um, and again, thinking back to when we were doing uh, personalized travel planning, company travel plans were a big thing. And, um, you know, companies are interested in um, their, the welfare of their employees and the happiness of their employees. So that's helpful for them. And also just the travel to work is, of course, a, a specific thing where, um, you know, some um, help uh, getting people to, to reduce their carbon is, is useful. Um, yeah, so I can say a bit more about how that works, but that's the, the basic idea is that, you know, there's a, there's a solution here, a short term solution, um, which can help, you know, all, all the other, a lot of the other things we're talking about, policies, technology, they're all going to take some time, so we need to do something now, and this is something that can happen, well, pretty well now. Thank you. you you very helpfully introduced a new thought there, that is the idea of carbon allowances in some form, that ra rather than trying to control things through price, which is my personal uh, uh, go-to uh, solution, you somehow allow people to have a, a ration of carbon. And, and by the way, I think the trick is that that needs to go across the piece, not just a transport carbon, but a carbon allowance. So, you know, that would um, catch the consumption of carbon in space heating and uh, all the other ways. Um, so, so I... So I just yeah. yeah so the, the part of the, the idea of the general climate level was a was a carbon allowance but so personal um, personal uh, carbon um, reduction planning is more of a behaviour change approach so it doesn't so it's just about talking to people giving them information helping them to identify where they can reduce their carbon and helping them to do that so it's, it doesn't involve any uh, carbon allowance or anything like that. So it's it's a behaviour change approach. Fair enough. Really, but yeah. the, 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 there is a harder version of that, which says... There is indeed, yeah. 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 Uh, I, you know, I'm just thinking that let's, in terms of a long-term plan, what we need is things that are happening in the short, immediate, in the medium and the long term. So that's that whole overall strategy is what we need is thinking about those different time frames. And realistically, anything um, pricing is going to take some time, at least two or three years to get in place. And uh, most of the technologies are, what's, are even further off. Yeah. Discuss. I mean, you change taxes more or less overnight. But anyway, let's come back to that. Thank you. I mean, of course, the one of the advantages of some kind of carbon allowance uh, is it it at face value gets over the equity point. It means that everybody gets it rather than uh, relying on a price mechanism, which of course arguably uh, discriminates against uh, poorer people. Um, now, uh, Andy Lee Eastlake is next up. Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you to everyone uh, who's probably covered most of the, uh, the interesting and uh, insightful thoughts already. But uh, I guess there's three points I wanted to sort of pick up on. Um, one of them's about the narrative and the communications. Uh, there's one about energy efficiency um, and one about Pareto. And, and if I can start with the, the narrative and communications, I think, um, and, and we touched on it, there's been a lot of discussion around that. But I think even at, right at the outset, the narrative that the government have put out about the net zero review is almost setting the wrong tone. To, to say we're going to review net zero to make sure it's not a burden is very different from saying we're going to review net zero to see how we can maximise the benefits of net zero and look at the right thing. So we're approaching the narrative in the wrong way. I think in, you know, in the same way and touching on um, some of the points on air quality, that the constant battle between central government and local government about clean air zones and whether you should or shouldn't have a charging one and, and these sort of things. That narrative, I think, has been quite, quite polluting. I think we've really got to change the way we articulate these things. If we have got a long-term net zero strategy, let's talk about it in the positive sense and the opportunities rather than immediately within this government sort of questioning it and, and, and sowing those seeds of, uh, uh, of questioning net zero. So I think narrative and communications are critical. And I think that really is one of the things uh, that touching on um, Tony's point about engaging the public. I think we've got a we, we've got what I'll call the, the silent uh, or nay lazy majority who actually do support the principles of uh, uh, reducing climate change and want to do the right thing, but very often don't engage with actually doing anything, partly because they don't necessarily know how. Um, and partly because it's just a bit too much effort and they've got too many other things going on to, uh, to focus on. So I think there's a real, and this brings me on to the energy efficiency, I think we've got to create a different relationship with energy. 
Um, and transport, I think, to me, is one of the ways of doing that. We've, we've missed a huge trick with not implementing solar PV on houses, uh, for example, in new builds, in the way that we've implemented a requirement to have charging points for new houses and retrofits, but we haven't created an energy uh, source within that house. And having solar people, we, we know from people who do that, that they have a different relationship with energy. They are looking at it, they're looking at where their energy comes from. They're looking not only about how much they're using, but also when they're using it. And I think that how much and when is a key thing that's going to come through in the energy narrative as, as we go forward. So I genuinely think we've got to create this really different relationship between the mass market and, and just reflecting, there's only about 2% of drivers are driving plug-in vehicles at the moment. 98% of people are still driving around in transport using conventional vehicles and just aren't engaged in this narrative. Uh, and some of the things that we talk about, there's always this jam tomorrow and, and, and giving people some something they can do today, I think, rather than, you know, the, the pace of change of technology is so rapid that within the, the cognoscenti, if I can call ourselves that, um, we're talking about things that might come out next year or the year after, you know, vehicle to grid, a great opportunity, but it really isn't real for most people today. Uh, and I think we need to be careful about undermining what can be done today with thoughts of this big future. And I guess the last point that I, which, which, which is really around Pareto, um, there's a danger of designing for the edge cases. By edge, I, I could equally refer to those as designing for the nut cases. So, uh, you know, for example, you know, I move house every few years, but I don't drive around in a removal truck just in case I want to move house. Uh, and we have a habit of trying to design to cover all of the bases and, and trying to please all the people all the time, which just isn't possible. And actually an awful lot of good stuff can be done, uh, with, you know, which isn't necessarily perfect. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we're in danger of doing some of that with, with the heavy duty vehicles, for example, at the moment, thinking about where we go, trying to design a solution for heavy duty vehicles without grappling with the lighter vehicles first. Uh, and I just, well, one last point that was really picking up on um, Andrea's commentary around air quality. And I think she's absolutely right that, that we learned from that, that diesel sort of conf uh, conflict, if you like, or, or between the, the greenhouse gas and, uh, uh, and air quality. We're in danger if we go down a hydrogen route of losing sight of this energy efficiency. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm not saying hydrogen is necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but we've got a very clear focus on zero tailpipe, which solves our air quality issues at a local level, but we're not embracing the energy efficiency in sufficient, uh, um, in sufficient way to really make sure we make the right thing. So, we, have, we may have learned, but I don't think we've learned uh, everything we need to, and we're in danger of making some of the same mistakes uh, with some of the solutions we come out with. So those are the three sort of areas that I think um, really need to be grappled with. Thank you, Andy, um, well, and points well made. Um, and uh, by the way, Greg Marsden, I owe an apology. I missed the fact he wanted to come in in response to Andrea's points on air quality, but there's a little uh, dialogue I see in the chat, uh, which I, I won't uh, invite you to talk to at the moment, but it is there for people to look at. So uh, I apologize, Andy, for not over Greg, for not, um, not bringing you in on that. Um, next up, uh, Phil Goodwin. <coughs> Uh, yes. Uh, am I live? You are. Yeah, good. Uh, thanks. Um, it seems to me the trouble is that the UK economy now has five simultaneous structural crises to contend with. <clears throat> Climate and Brexit and Covid and energy, of course. But now a quite bizarre crisis of governance is itself, which affects how government can influence or, or, or tackle all the other crises. And also, I think, affects how much one should treat government statements as constraints, especially on timing. On climate, I guess we'd all say that net zero by 2050 is not a sufficient target. Targets for 2030 are decisive, and therefore so is the trajectory to 2025. 
And every year that passes, the short run becomes more important, not less. Even before the current crises, we in transport were not on a trajectory consistent with climate policy. That had already been accepted explicitly by both DFT and the Climate Change Committee, but they haven't yet agreed how far away we are from that target, uh, partly because the DFT has declined to actually publish the figures underpinning their desired trajectory. Uh, The decarbonisation strategy, however, as published, certainly envisaged moving closer to the necessary path, which was positive. And the signals we are getting from this month's government would take us further away from the necessary trajectory. Doubling down on the road programme, I think, does not make sense because the credibility of the actual case for the programmed road projects in RIS 2 or RIS 3 is put in doubt both by the success of decarbonisation, which will involve road traffic reductions, not growth, and also by the failure of decarbonisation, which at a global level would mean fundamental changes in the physical and economic geography so profound that they would make nonsense of all current transport plans. And I think that analysis in Wales and Scotland is in advance of England on those questions. A large part of the current road programme will increase carbon and has a very poor economic value for money and is a prime target for better use of the funds at times of emergency, not a priority for safeguarding. Not all schemes labelled safety are the most effective ways of improving safety. Now, is there a silver lining to this? Um, Prospects for energy prices, inflation, living costs, real incomes and employment, all rather unpleasant, are being used as justifications to relax the pressure on decarbonisation. But I think they may paradoxically have the opposite effect as people are forced to find that they can make levels of behavioural change far more drastic and far swifter than those which were deemed impossible as part of decarbonisation. That's a rather dubious example of a silver lining, I think, but it may do some of the heavy lifting, as Greg mentioned. And I do agree with Stephen Joseph that the political scene may change fundamentally and perhaps very swiftly. So let's not put road pricing back in the 10 years away box, which had started to open and needs to stay open. Thank you, Phil. Um, two, two immediate responses. Uh, yes, on the one thing that we hadn't picked up before you mentioned it uh, was that over the last six months, the, 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 the road taxation and pricing issue has become, as it inevitably will, become more and more urgent to, to, to deal with. And there are big opportunities there uh, for us on the carbon agenda to, to make a contribution there. And secondly, um, just your plea about road schemes, um, it, it's the same point. L- let's agree not to be prejudicial about the outcome, but we need to do the sums properly and do the appraisals properly and make sure we clear what we want to achieve and that the schemes we select do achieve it. Whether it means in the event it's road schemes or some rail schemes or some bus schemes or whatever is, is up for discussion. Um, but we shouldn't just assume every road scheme is bad, and you're not saying that, I know, and we shouldn't assume every public transport scheme is good. We need to do the sums uh, and make that point repeated at government. They shouldn't make assumptions. Um, Any other comments? Uh, I need to actually push push the discussion along just in in terms of time. Um, Okay, I'll go to uh, Chris Todd. Thanks, Stephen. I think just picking up on on that last point, I mean, I've got about four points I'd briefly like to just cover, um, some of which have been 
touched on by, by other speakers, understandably, given the, the breadth and depth of, of knowledge already gone ahead of me. Um, but I think fundamentally we do need to challenge this sort of ideology that road schemes are good and deliver growth. Um, I think people are being allowed, politicians are being allowed to get away with just saying that without any evidence to back up the justification. And I saw on Twitter the last few days, I see Andy Street welcoming a road scheme and people saying, well, where's the proof? You know, you're just saying these things are going to deliver growth and green growth, but where's the proof? You, you can't be allowed to get away with it. And I think we need to be challenging that. That I mean, it is an ideology, really. I mean, I, I take the point that not all road schemes necessarily are bad and we might need some road schemes, but the, the sort of unspoken, inverted commas, truth behind those politicians' words are that roads are good and they are green and they will deliver growth. Whereas we've already heard they're not necessarily the most effective way and they're not a very efficient way of, of, of using public funds to deliver that growth. Um, and then conversely, I think we also need to be sort of saying, how and where we can deliver growth in a much more efficient way. So which schemes, which types of proposals will do that? Um, I'm slightly reticent about the use of, you know, we use appraisals to make the case for a, a good scheme or a bad scheme. Because I know in Wales, for example, they're a bit more reticent about appraisals because appraisals have been set up to deliver road schemes effectively that's what the, that's what the outcomes always seem to deliver and actually more important is what is the vision that you want to achieve um, we hear a lot amongst certainly a lot of the regional and sometimes the local planning authorities about vision and validating we're moving towards a new approach of visioning and validating what we want to see happen um, rather than predict and provide yet once they've announced that headline and made a few good words, they go straight back into the predict and provide um, approach. Um, so I think we need to think more about what do we actually need to and want to see um, and be slightly sceptical about some of the appraisal processes is because a lot of them are based on small time savings, which I think a lot of people would find they, they wouldn't notice them if they didn't happen. I mean, 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, yes. But when you're talking like 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever, I think in a, in a longish journey, those those sorts of time savings are just lost in the noise. Um, yet they account for quite significant sums of money which justify a particular scheme. Um, I think alongside all of this, we also need to be challenging much more robustly the cuts that have happened and are happening to public transport because that is undermining the ability of um, us to have an alternative narrative, to provide alternatives, to give people choice. There's already a lot of concern about the cuts that have seemed to have gone, gone through already, largely either, well, they've not gone through unnoticed by the people affected, but they have gone through unnoticed by the wider um, transport community or certainly the, the media. Um, and they're causing quite considerable problems. And they're also potentially undermining um, the bounce back from COVID. There's quite a few train services, for example, which are very crowded now because of the, the cuts in frequency. Um, and yet people are wanting to travel. Um, there are real problems now with making connections between many services because of the cuts in those frequencies or even actually achieving any sensible journey whatsoever. Um, and for the sounds of it, more of that's coming down the line with in, in terms of buses. Um, and, the, and the fourth point I just wanted to flag up was about, um, I think there needs to be a change in approach to how we access services or consider ownership. It's a bit like, I suppose, the housing market. Do you have to own a home or do you need to you know, rent a home? You know, what's the more, more, more important thing? And I think some of that is starting to happen in terms of transport, but do we actually need to own everything that we travel by? We don't own a train, for example, personally. We don't own a bus. Do we need to own a car? Um, and I think that is quite uh, an important thing to be talking about, because if we swap out all of our existing petrol and diesel cars for electric vehicles, we're going to be in many of the same problems as we're facing now, maybe with slightly cleaner air, but that's going to require 
a huge investment in energy infrastructure upgrades, um, which is going to place a huge burden on the public purse. And that was something that was flagged up by the Climate Change Committee, for example. Um, equally, if we're talking about decarbonisation, a lot of the manufacturing processes for these new vehicles at this moment in time are going to be heavily carbonised. So we're actually creating quite a huge carbon burden there as well. But again, it's, it's, it's off grid in terms of what we see in terms of transport on the road. So people don't necessarily consider it, but actually it should be part of the consideration as to what we're incentivizing in the transport sphere, because that is quite a significant impact that isn't currently really addressed. Thank you, Chris. Um, a whole can of worms in what you've just said, in, in my view. Uh, forgive me if I unfairly characterise your position, but you seem to me to be saying, let's not accept what the politicians assert to be the truth in relation to roads. Fair enough. But then you're saying you don't like the evidence such as it is, and you seem to assert you know what the real answer is. Uh, and uh, we've got a problem with that line of argument, it seems to me. Uh, let's come back to it if we've got time, but we have to agree what we, what we recognise as evidence for these propositions and what we don't. And if we don't think there's no evidence of any, for anything, we're in real trouble. Um, anyway, let, let's go on for the moment. Um, we've got now, um, thankfully, somebody who can speak about logistics and freight, which we always don't do enough on. Ian Wainwright. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, so um, very much from freight and logistics, but from my background, very much sort of last mile stuff, um, which is where I'm focused on. But there's a there's, there's a lack of understanding in the policies that we've had recently for actually understanding how freight works as a system, sort of end to end. Um, so the future of freight plan talked about net zero, but and it talked about energy, which I think is important, as Andy mentioned. Um, but there's no there's no funding, there's no real linking it together. So we end up with lots of local authorities all pushing for cargo bikes, um, which might be good in the local area, but without understanding the complete supply chain, you don't know what's happening in the first mile. And we have to make sure if we're going to decarbonize the last mile that we decarbonize the rest of it. If it's manufacturing in China or it's avocados growing in Peru or whatever, you know, those have got to get to us. And at the moment, that's the bit that's causing the real issue. Um, so there's something about the training and the knowledge and the upskilling of policymakers. Um, there was a recent survey of the local government association, um, uh, I think it was about May, June time, that really sort of said, oh, give us, give us guidance, DFT, because they don't know. And they, th there are so few people in local authorities who understand freight. Um, to do something about freight, it is the same set of solutions for air quality, carbon, road safety, et cetera. Um, we can improve the vehicles. We can make them safe, safer, cleaner, quieter. Um, and that, a lot of that has been happening um, through regulation. Um, clean air zones through, clean air zones are interesting because they actually are driving the freight industry to you know, lower carbon vehicles quicker. I would suggest. Um, so the next stage up from there is the shift bit, which is about retiming some of it. Why aren't we delivering more overnight? Why aren't we using certain key routes rather than, you know, just allowing it to go anywhere? Um, but there's some avoid things. Um, the government said they'll do more on modal shift, um, but we've still got nothing from the Department for Leveling Up. Anything about land use planning, whether that be um, home delivery of stuff where you can actually pull off the, the main road, so you don't lead to congestion, um, but also consolidation through particularly things like procurement. Um, public sector procurement is a huge amount of um, GDP. Um, we've got businesses who have got things like the sustainable dis disclosure requirements that were updated last year, whether they're actually doing any good or not, I don't know, but those elements um, are important, but there's also something probably about sort of the taxation that's still not been solved between online and the high street, um, which is forcing people to, um, well, forcing them easier. If we, as humans, we like things easy. So we all order stuff online, 
but every time we order it, um, it's breaking down into smaller and smaller consignments. And effectively, the smaller the consignment and the quicker we want it, or the quicker it's delivered to us, the higher the carbon intensity. Um, and there's sort of research on that. Um, and people have sort of said, oh, well, a lot of the instant stuff will disappear with the cost of living crisis and stuff. Um, we know that um, families with lower incomes tend to end up buying more things like McDonald's rather than cooking from fresh. You know, the, 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 the economics and what we would like to happen doesn't always occur. So I think we need to have a bit more of an honest conversation. Um, we certainly need to look and see how the hell we get rid of free delivery because free delivery does not exist, however much we like it when it pops up when we order something. Um, we just do something about the procurement um, and that sort of working with others. Um, and a final thought which occurred to me when people were talking earlier about the sort of, um, you know, the general environment cuts that the, this, this administration want to make. I mean, whether they survive for long, we'll wait and see. But um, there certainly seemed to be a big concerted pushback from a lot of the um, charities like the RSPB and National Trust and things to sort of actually say there's, there's things here that they don't like. And I think there's a bit of a coalition of people on some of this stuff that says it's not going to go back in the box just because a politician doesn't want to deal with it. But I'm never hopeful. That's about it. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, it, uh, very well put. Um, isn't your point about deliveries and so on um, an example of Philip Selwood's discussion that here's the market delivering a particular outcome? Uh, people do that what they do because that's what the market offers them, as it were, at a particular price, but the prices are not correct. They're being they're given, given the incentive to do something on a very large scale. It's a massive change in behavior over a short period of time, um, which is not a great outcome because the price is not correctly set. Yep. Philip? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a fair point, Stephen. Um, I think Part of it is that we've um, it's been like a sort of drip, 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 uh, sort of drug approach where we've we've if you sort of put it in the context of retail, for instance, when you when you think of, you know, buy one, get one free, it's actually quite indefensible, whether it's from an economic or an environmental point of view, but the market has sought to provide it. So I'm not suggesting for one minute that the, the market is, you know, has all the answers, because if you don't if you don't externalize some of those prices, you're actually just storing up, um, as Ian is saying, storing up more issues. You yeah, know, there is no such thing as free. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I think you also have to recognize that the market is responding to a desire from from a large percentage of the population. And what you can't do is suddenly decide that you're going to ban home deliveries you know we've got to work around that in terms of proper pricing yeah i mean yeah. You, you, yeah. you can't you can't ban it but the market the market is definitely broken because it's not paying for the cost the full cost no, all the way through absolutely um, and and the retailers are if you like generating um a demand that wasn't previously there it's sort of if you think about the instant grocery delivery companies they're sort of almost infantilizing infantile whatever they're making us more like children because we can't we're, we're, we're sort of it's basically saying oh if you forget a pint of milk we can deliver it to you in 15 minutes sorry but you know you go shopping once a week you could actually do it if you did your online order once a week you know it, it, go down the shop walk that's probably the most sustainable way of doing it it is, but I think it's got to be priced properly. That's the answer. And then I think you might see people's behaviour change quite radically. So the, two, the two points for me are, here's an example where the market can produce behavioural change very, very quickly on a large scale because the general population is, is doing it, um, not just, just a few individuals. But be careful what you ask for. You, you have to get construct the market correctly in some sense in relation to policy. Um, Hillary Chipping, I know you're not next on the list, but you were nodding a lot during that, and it's kind of in your bailiwick. Do you want to come do your piece now? Yeah, thank you. I mean, there's, there's been so much um, interesting uh, discussion that uh, it's, it's difficult to know where, 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 to, where to start, and, and I'm particularly interested in logistics because the part of the country that my local enterprise partnership covers, the South East Midlands, it is the heart of, of logistics and, uh, and, and we, we do talk a lot to the logistics companies. Um, but the, 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 the few points that I, I wanted to make, first of all, there's been a number of um, 
uh, points made about this call for evidence from the government, which um, again, as a local enterprise partnership, we're talking to businesses, getting direct um, feedback on, on on what they have to say. And it's interesting that you talked about the uh, the narrative, um, because if you actually look at the questions, they're, they're actually much more interesting than, than that sort of narrative about you know what's getting in the way of of, um, of net zero because it's the, the first the very first question is how does net zero enable us to meet our economic growth target of 2.5 percent a year um, and in terms of the questions for businesses it's about um what opportunities does does net zero off, offer you as a business so I, I think there will be some quite interesting evidence coming out of that but the, the point that I wanted to make about, I think it's really important to focus on, on small and medium sized businesses because they do make up a, a very high proportion of, uh, uh, of businesses across the whole country. And we did a survey um, recently um, and one of the questions was about businesses wanting to become more environmentally friendly. 46% of businesses um, said yes, they had the intention to become environmentally friendly, but only 11% of them had a target to achieve that, and only 4% of them had set a deadline to that, that commitment. And I think what we're finding is, is that people are looking for practical solutions. I think, I think there is uh, an intent there. Uh, and so one of the, the sort of very small measures that, that we've put in place is we've used some funding from government, the Community Renewal Fund, to set up a, a green recovery um, uh, and investment um, plan, which means that um, businesses can just apply for first of all support so we put we put small businesses in line with in touch with experts to actually set up a a, a plan for you know, how they can move towards net zero and then we give small grants so they can actually do some of the practical things that have come out of that plan to help them to move in that direction i think sometimes i mean a number of people have said you need some sort of small steps short term steps to help move in the right direction as well as having having the bigger picture so i think there are some practical um, solutions, not, not solutions, but things that can be done, which was one of the questions I think we were asked. Secondly, on, on the pricing, I absolutely um, I, I agree with, with, with Stephen. I think it's incentives through pricing that, that are important. Now, I know there's a huge debate about um, how, how people um, don't take very kindly to certainly uh, discussions around road pricing, for example. But with, with regard to energy, and just again, a sort of practical point, um, there was a study carried out in, in Milton Keynes, um, funded by Bayes, just to find out how they could um, actually put incentives you know, through council taxes, business rates um, on commercial properties to become more um, energy efficient. And, and one of the one of the points that came out was that actually the data that, that we have at the moment around um, energy performance, EPCs, is it, just not not very good it's not it's not good to in terms of targeting where we'd want to have those sorts of price incentives so i think i think another point to make is that we actually need good data good evidence in order to to put um pricing incentives in place and and to and and to reach um conclusions i mean the the debate around around um roads and uh, the way in which roads are, are appraised um, and time savings is, is something that I've been involved in for for, for many many years, um, and I, I think it is apps. I think it is really important to to actually understand um, that, that that evidence. Um, I mean, on 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 roads, I, I, I was I was surprised to see in the uh, in the annex to the uh, to, to the growth plan, um, the, the sort of the um, 80, 80 or so. Uh, no, 90, 90, well, yes, 80 or so road schemes and then some rail schemes. Some of those, you know, I know personally have been around for many, many, many years. Um, there are issues around why they haven't been delivered often to do with the, their environmental impact. But I think it's just a, an example of if, if you know, government is asking, putting a lot of them um, sort of uh, faith in, in asking local authorities, local elected politicians and MPs you know what what do you think would deliver growth and that's where you know many of these road projects have come from but I think just a sort of blanket saying you know roads roads are bad um is not necessarily I, I would say although I've, I've seen Greg's comment um necessarily the right the right way to look at uh, infrastructure because um you know we we, we do need to um roads for 
buses and other forms of public transport to travel around we need to encourage more people to cycle safely and in rural areas it's actually quite difficult to walk and cycle safely over any any distant long distances so some of the infrastructure investment could be and should be around you know, enabling um, people to travel around um, in, in a more sustainable way. Um, just on on the sort of local local authority impact, I mean, I think it's really important to have um, more strategic planning over a broader area. Um, whereas in fact the government's sort of moving back to um, individual local authorities. But in terms of local area energy planning, um, the Energy Systems Catapult did a study quite recently about how many local authorities actually are um, carrying out these uh, uh, um, area energy plans. And only 15 local authority districts actually have a plan in place. So I think we've got a long way to go in terms of, uh, uh, of proper planning. Um, and then on the on the issue about a new bill, which I think you know Steve Gooding um, rightly sort of mentioned right at the beginning, that there is so many new homes being built at the moment, and again in the area that um, where I am, sort of Milton Keynes, South East Midlands, I think we've got six percent of housing completions nationally being built in this area. And so, and they're not being built in the, it, the houses are not being built in an energy efficient way. And it's that, you know, with a few of them have solar panels, not that many, most of them, probably all of them have gas boilers as the occasional um, charging point. There's so much more um, that we could do, again, through through government regulation to at least ensure that that, that new homes were, were, were being built in, in an energy efficient way. And then the people, people would actually learn about the, you know, the, the positive effects of, of energy efficiency and would demand more energy efficiency. I mean, it's taken a long time for, um, for people to demand proper um, fibre broadband. Uh, I, I can remember sort of 10 or 15 years ago, trying to put the case to um to developers that actually you, know, you need to build the sort of ducting into new homes so that people will will be able to access faster broadband now it seems obvious but you know that that, that case um has, has to be made um so those are those are the sort of few points that that, that that i wanted to make but the logistics um discussion is 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 so um interesting because you know we've and i I don't think it, I mean, because we, um, we, we've all sort of decided, well, during the pandemic, we had to do more ordering um, and uh, things are being delivered to our homes. But of course, with that saving um, uh, carbon in terms of we're not making the journeys out, out to actually um, uh, buy those, um, th those goods. So I think, you know, I think there's quite an interesting balance if we get the pricing right, as, as, as Ian mm -hmm. said, then there can be advantages um, in, in efficiently um, delivering uh, delivering um, goods to, to to our homes. But clearly, we've got a long way to go. But but thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Well well put. Um, uh, just put, put, put yeah. back into that. I yeah. think yeah. There's, there's some work. And I don't know whether it was the RAC Foundation, Steve, but the um, there was certainly some work done about what people do with their time when they don't drive to go shopping. Um, and a lot of it was they went and drove somewhere else instead. Um, so that that's probably still a bit debatable, but clearly it's the, you know, ideally, yes, if we have our home deliveries and things, then we're not going out and ordering stuff. But it's still how you how you break down one pallet to one box and how many one boxes get delivered. Thank you. And I, I'm reminded, I'm coming to Julian where next. Um, but in that context, I'm reminded of that excellent piece of work that was done when the early days of Boris Johnson as mayor, uh, what was it called? The, the, the thing about uh, uh, the roads policy in, in London, which did a very uh, elegant piece about all the different uses that roads uh, are used for. I mean, logistics, of course, but um, not just for moving cars around. We mustn't forget uh, all of that. Anyway, uh, Julian, Julian Ware. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I spotted your point at the beginning, Stephen, about this not being Chatham House. I'm obviously a TfL official. Don't think I'm going to be telling you uh, TfL policy. Um, and I'm going to try and keep it sort of reasonably factual and leave the criticisms for others. Um, I think the points I draw out are partly in the chat earlier, which is that if you look at London's transport system post-COVID, it has got capacity. We're 
running the tube at about 80%, it's been creeping up of pre-COVID levels. And we've actually added, you know, the Elizabeth line and one or two other bits and pieces. So there's a bit more capacity than there was before. That's going with a very significant sort of squeeze on the resources available. Uh, and that will make uh, expansions of sort of heavy public transport difficult. It also makes continuing things like electrifying the, the bus fleet difficult. And as you know, um, road user charging is uh, probably the leading option to find more funding uh, for the system, but is highly uh, political and there can be quite strong uh, opposition to it. So I personally reckon that a number of the greening things will come back, both about where the tube's power supply comes from, uh, but also about a stronger move to uh, get rid of the diesel bus fleet as we get some uh, more resources. And I think I would sum up by saying, looked at from a sort of city perspective, I think that the transport problems seem less difficult somehow than some of the housing refit problems. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And yes, interesting points there. So to the extent that the behaviour change because of COVID sticks, it, it has made urban transport a little easier because of the, um, the flattening of the peaks and the reduction in, in, in peak demand. And that applies, I imagine, across the country in terms of public transport. Well, we've been able to keep our service levels up, which may be a different factor from uh, some of the other transport providers uh, elsewhere. And whilst for us, 80% of capacity, 20% of lost revenue, 1 billion quid is a huge problem. I'm always trying to remind people for our punters, it means that their journeys are more comfortable. The flattening of, say, the Monday morning peak and the fact that evenings are busier, but mornings are less busy, is probably, again, a good thing for the system. It's just we've currently got no money to do anything uh, with. Yeah, but by the same token, it reduces the pressure to invest a lot of new capital in, in extra peak capacity, which is certainly in the London Rail case has been a big issue in the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that begs the question, of course, about the extent to which the travel patterns do or don't return to what they used to be. And it's, it's a different story on the local road network, I think. Um, OK, thank you for that. Um, do we have Michael Solomon Williams on the call? I don't see him there. Are you there? Yes, I'm here, Stephen, yes. Ah, ah you're, go. Hello, I can, I can oh, see yes, you. There you are, I see you. Yeah, I can see everyone. And uh, well, well, good morning. And, and uh, well, it's, it's great to be here. And thanks for um, having me on. I, I get the sense very much that um, I'm among um, seasoned experts and, and uh, people who've been in the field for a very long time, um, many of whom I'm of whom I'm aware anyway, and what have been aware for a long time. So it's, I feel very happy to be here. I'm, um, I'm new at CBT. You, you'll know Sylvia, I'm sure, and, and Norman and my colleagues at Campaign for Transport very well. Um, I'm, I'm a month and a so or so into the into the team as part of the newly expanded campaigns team. So um, really, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just going to sum up um, the, the the report release of which many of you are aware. Because Stephen, I saw you last week at the report, and Andrea, um, many uh, many others, I think, would have been um, at the report of the uh, Pay as You Drive report, which we should call it. And um, important important to sum up that it's um, that it, we're referring to as Pay as You Drive rather than road pricing. And I think. Um, this was um, this point was emphasised um, by the president of the AA as well, who, um, who with whom you'll, many of you will be familiar. Um, and I mean, the, the the point being that the public has to see to shifting. So it's you know this is the big top line, really, isn't it? And and we were pleased that it was picked up um, by some unexpected corners of the press, including the Express, um, who you wouldn't think would normally be on side, but they actually um, reported quite positively on it. Um, and yeah, the the. The USP of our report really is that um, that there was a public survey conducted with three thousand people in collaboration with More in Common, and um, and fifty percent of people are actually in favour of pay as you drive, which is a big shift. Um, so um, to an extent, things are moving in the right direction. Um, the next question, and I'm sure many of you will know better than I do, yes, you know about what what needs to take place for that to actually get through into um, into policy. Um, but in terms of research, you know, we're in a better position than ever, I think. 
Um, and the, the EV question is huge. Obviously, there's a huge black hole with EVs. Um, part of the thrust of the, of the report is to uh, accept the fact that EVs are the future um, on account of the 2030 cutoff. Um, and, and sort of work with work with that, that as part of the future. But as many have pointed out, I think including Chris pointed out later on, um, EVs can't be the only answer. They're not a silver bullet. We're aware of that. We know that particle pollution from brake dust and and um, and tire tire particle pollution is is a huge factor. In fact, you know maybe two thousand times as bad in some according to some studies as um, as tailpipes. So um, you know from our perspective, we do want to work um, beyond EVs directly replacing um, all, all existing road transport, but um, but yeah, that's our that's our um, our latest big news really is, the, is that report. Um, and otherwise, I mean, we're working on on uh, parallel campaigns, domestic aviation. And um, there was reference. I can't remember who was um, if it was Greg, perhaps who was talking earlier on about the 2050, 2025 sort of target dates, and twenty fifty being you know we're transport having been behind the behind the curve to an extent. Um, on that front, we we are looking to align with T um, and E Transport and Environment on uh, twenty twenty five. As a target to reduce domestic aviation, and from businesses in particular. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I personally would agree that we do need to pull further forward than 2050 um, as a target date from the point of view of net zero. So, domestic aviation is a big one. Um, we've referred already this morning to to fares um, and excess fares as being a preventative to getting people back on trains and buses. Um, that's a campaign we have. Fair fares campaign. It's an ongoing campaign, and we're we're keeping the pressure up on that. Um, the as Stephen, you talked about the um, the, the cliff face and peak as well. That's something that we want to get beyond because I think the the peak cliff edge is it's a nineteen ninety three thing, isn't it? It's, a, it's an early days privatisation thing, and um, and we really want to um, campaign as much as we can to get beyond the cliff edge. Whatever happens with GBR, I think um, many will know that uh, Great British Railways is is up in the air for the time being. Um, we've written to Anne Marie Trevelyan, and, and we haven't haven't heard back yet, and um, and we're pushing on that. We are meeting with them. Um, it's Andrew Haynes, I think, who's, who's setting up the um, GVR transition team soon, and we'll find out what the latest is. But it is unfortunately up in the air. Nevertheless, um, it's important that we do we do work to get beyond the uh, the cliff edge because it's fairly outdated. So um, that's a campaign. Other campaigns, yes, good to hear Andrea um, and see you again. And talking about air pollution because that's um, I mentioned in the chat that's a new campaign we'd like to work on. So it'd be great to work with Leeds um, ITS actually, if possible, on developing some some stats to back up a campaign. And I know that that you know we're, we're in um, groups with Clean Air Coalition, um, and there are people who are working exclusively on that, and the um, um, and Ella um, Ella's Law campaign as well. Uh, it's in a sense, is very much focused on air pollution as a discrete thing. And um, we do want to develop a, a persuasive, healthy transport focused approach to air pollution if possible and really put that forward as um as uh, as a as an answer in many respects so that's one of our campaigns we have ongoing campaigns of course related to buses and rail and things that you will all know about but um that's that's us for now i won't i won't go on to it can i share a link to the basic drive report yes absolutely will do lauren absolutely but yes Graham, very nice to meet you all um and i'm I hope to catch up a lot more in the next in the coming months and years and, and have lots more to say in the future. Really nice to meet you. Michael, Michael, thank you. Um, and just to reiterate for those who may not have seen it, that piece that you published last week was um, doing absolutely the right thing. It was it was trying to understand what ordinary people feel about all of this and perhaps coming up with a conclusion the politicians might not have found uh, uh, found obvious. Do you, can you say anything about what kind of reception it's had? Um, I mean, we all noticed the Prime Minister's acid comment about um, uh, think tanks with a, and a hidden agenda, uh, which was very unhelpful, I thought. Uh, yeah. Um, did you get a good reception? Did people, the general public, find what you were saying um, rang true? Yeah, well, the, I, I know we're probably all... <laughs> The um, anti-growth coalition on this call. Uh, I accept that. Um, it, it, yes, a, a general public. Um, I haven't had a response feed through to us since last week from the public beyond that of the press. I mean, we have had positive responses. We, we sent it to um, to lords and MPs, and we've had we haven't had any um, any resentful responses. We've had lots of very positive responses from a fairly surprising range of of, um, of lords, actually, which is good. Um, general public, yes, I'm afraid I, I can't say beyond the report itself. But I think, as I say, that's that's the um, 
that's the new element of this report because we as, as you discussed last week we've been this has been a, a long long project for 50 odd years you know working towards road pricing or pay as you drive um, but this is the first time there's been there's been that public survey. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I, you know, I don't know the response since last week um, without sort of trawling the comment section of the Daily Express website, which is not my favourite. And, and, and no detectable response from the Treasury, I suppose. Um, I don't believe so, no. No, no. And Steve, Steve Gooding shakes his head, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'll just put that link in. That, that's helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Right, uh, last on my list is Stephen Joseph, uh, but um, Leon Daniels, um, I'll, I'll invite you to say something if you want to after, after Stephen Joseph uh, had his word. Stephen. Uh, <clears throat> hello, uh, thanks Stephen. Um, and uh, coming uh, towards the end, lots of the things I would have wanted to say have already been said, but I've got a few comments I wanted to make. Um, uh, firstly, um, uh, I, I think, um, the, the narratives point is very important. In some ways, one of the issues for this government is that they've lost the narrative. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, particularly on growth, I mean, uh, I'm not sure Greg needs to worry about um, uh, resistance because it sounds like every single green group is up in arms about it's in a way away from climate specifically. Um, the government's proposals to um, get rid of all EU regulations by the end of next year seems to have got lots of people, including lots of Conservatives, very riled about that. Um, and that will have its impact on transport as well, of course, because it affects um, pollution and biodiversity targets. Um, uh, just a, a few comments I wanted to make. Um, Firstly, I, I've been doing some. Uh, I've been doing some work with the Transport Planning Society. They, uh, we did. A, I did a report for them uh, a couple of years ago on the state of the nations, and um, they've asked for a refresh on that, an update. Um, one of the things that's really clear is how the extent to which um, the other three nations of the UK are diverging from England uh, in lots of different ways on planning and transport policy um, I, I, you know, to pick at random um, the welsh government is doing a review of roads um, which is i think due out next month uh, from what i've heard um, that isn't going to say we're not going to put down another square inch of, car of tarmac it's going to say what kind of roads and investment do we want um, reflecting very much some of the previous um, discussion um, both um, from individuals and in the chat um, and um, uh, so I think it might, for example, talk about investment in parallel cycle routes to trunk roads to allow for e-bike um, uh, growth, for instance. Um, so um, uh, the Welsh Government uh, is doing that. The Northern Ireland Government, before it disappeared, um, uh, froze public transport fares. Um, the Scottish Government has a target to reduce traffic levels. Um, uh, these are, you know, there's a range of things. And then you go into even English local authorities, where Greg will know Leeds has a target of um, moving to net zero um, uh, in transport much uh, and much earlier. Uh, and that's not alone. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that this isn't just a city thing. Um, I spent some time in Cornwall the other week. Um, they've got, they, they're doing uh, an experiment on reduced fares. Um, they've got had government funding to reduce um, bus fares um, so that uh, you nobody pays more than five pounds a day to travel across Cornwall, two pounds fifty in different towns, um, discounts for under 19s, all day family tickets of 10 pounds. I'm not sure um, uh, uh, anybody's doing monitoring of this stuff in the way that Greg is suggesting, but it will be very interesting to see what comes out of that. and the associated stuff they're doing around um, integrated ticketing, uh, Leon may well know about this, um, you know, uh, tap on, tap off, funded, I should say, by Hillary's equivalent down there, the Local Enterprise Partnership paid for all the ticketing uh, technology um, as part of its local growth fund money. So uh, the point I, uh, first point I'd make is there's lots of other stuff going on. Um, 
outside what central government's doing and we need to, uh, to to find that reflect on it and celebrate it and monitor it where we can um my second point um agreeing very strongly with what philip and uh, lauren and others have been saying business is doing lots of stuff at the moment um i chair the smart transport program for bow media um i see and talk to individual businesses who are doing lots of investment in um alternatives to single occupancy car use and ownership um and um that's um uh, uh, you know uh, uh, and uh, there is lots going on there um and buried in the transport decarbonisation plan is the idea of commute zero uh, a commute zero initiative and raising average vehicle occupancy if that means anything at all it need, there's a dweeby but really important thing that needs to happen to national highways, which is that it should measure um, throughput by people rather than vehicles. At the moment, a coach has, well, actually, it's probably regarded as a, a, a disincentive, it is a bad thing to have because it takes up lots more room than a car. But certainly a vehicle that has one person in it has no more status than a vehicle with four people in it. Um, but actually doing something about measuring um, throughput, that's not an, uh, that would have big carbon implications, but um, it would also actually improve the efficiency of the road network in old fashioned terms. Um, uh, so I think the, there's a, a story there that um, we, I mean, there was going to be, I think, some work on um, uh, sharing vehicles and so on before um, the new uh, ministers came in. I don't know if it'll stay, um, but that's going to be really important. One of the things we hear uh, in talking to people like, say, Enterprise Cars and Live Share on this that gets in the way is benefit in kind rules. If you transfer a car from a company car to a pool car scheme, it automatically attracts benefit in kind taxation because it's seen as something that could be used for private benefit. Um, and um, so there are minor things like that that will make a difference, that will make a big difference to the scope three achievements and targets. Um, that's one of the questions we've been set. Um, so- Stephen, just in interest of time, uh... Yeah, Can you wind up? that was where I was going to stop. Oh. I, I'm basically two things. Um, local, uh, local and devolved authorities are doing lots of really interesting stuff and we need to celebrate and monitor that. And secondly, businesses are doing interesting things, but there are things that government and government agencies could do to support them and make things happen. Thank you so much. Um, uh, 10 seconds from Philip and 10 seconds from Steve Gooding before I go on to uh, Liam Daniels. Yeah, just to say, Stephen, I think your point about local initiatives is, is brilliantly well made. The biggest challenge we have at the moment is introducing central government to some of these initiatives, because I've lost count of the number of times talking to DFT, OLEV, Scottish Transport, where they say something can't be done. And then you can use an illustration, whether it's Cornwall, West Midlands, Leeds or whatever, where it is patently being done and done successfully. But there seems to be very little central DNA that's really picking up on this stuff. And perhaps initiatives like today's, this morning's uh, initiative might be a way of just making sure that they're in touch with those initiatives, those place-based initiatives. Thank you. Um, Leon. Well, you'll notice I very cunningly organised myself to get the last word. So thank you so much <laughs> for that. But I just, I just no, really no, wanted I, to end. I the last word. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to end, end this 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 part of the session really being really very per pessimistic, um, which is I am deeply concerned about where we now go on government policy. Um, we have a new government. We've got economic turmoil. Um, I think this is the biggest opportunity as far as zero carbon is concerned to t talk more and do less. And I think the government uh, is in that place. If it wasn't discussed in the hustings, it's not going to be done. So it's really clear we're not going to get a transport bill, which will make forming Great British Railways uh, quite difficult. Um, and all this talk and slow progress uh, is compounded by the fact the public now knows the government has got infinite resources to do anything it wants to do. It can pay 80% of people's wages for two years. 
um, it, 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 it can find money for energy caps. And therefore, government, if you want us to go zero carbon, you will have to pay us uh, to do it. And then just add on to that the desperation to regain popularity, where we are with devolution, multiple crises and all the rest of it. And I just think the government is going to talk a really good story. And the other half of the people that were mentioned earlier who wouldn't vote for road pricing, uh, I, I, I think everybody who is keen for the progress on zero emission to be as slow as possible um, will we'll welcome it. And I just observed finally, um, even though there was legislation, smoking in public and wearing seat belts didn't actually become normal until it became a social issue. And I think our job uh, at the Greener Journeys Council and um, uh, sorry, Greener Transport Solutions, etc., is to just make sure that we are convincing the world at large about the so social issues and making sure those social issues are continually reinforced, because if we don't, um, we'll just find ourselves, uh, I'm afraid, where we've been uh, with others, which is people are broadly in favour of imp improved air quality, but they personally have a special need to use their petrol or diesel vehicle. Yeah, thank you. Just as they're broadly in favour of motherhood. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, any responses to that? That's point very well made. OK, well, uh, has everybody had their say now? Have I missed anybody? Um, I'm afraid Gillian, we, we didn't see, but um, there we go. Uh, any overall comments anybody would like to add? Uh, we've come really to the end of our time. Let, let me just make a, 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 well, a can of a summary. I think it's been a very interesting conversation, as it always is. Um, and very hard to, as it were, push the debate along. We, we heard it several times, particularly at the beginning, an appeal for more better leadership. Um, and uh, Leon was hinting at that too. And I, as I said, it's, it's not very helpful just to ask for it. It has to happen somehow. Somebody has to do it. Um, it's like, it is like motherhood. But we did hear a lot of um, comments about the need for whatever it is a future government does should be based on evidence, proper evidence, whatever it is they're proposing will actually solve the problem they say they want to solve and not to rely on prejudice and fashion. Um, there's so much to be done on that and that is an area where uh, we, people around this table have and should in the future make a contribution to try and get the debate a little bit more founded in the science of all of this. Um, we've noticed in passing that the latest, the, the previous fashion on levelling up has more or less sunk without trace suddenly. Uh, it was an important policy, wasn't quite clear what it meant. Um, there was a need for evidence on that, but now it's growth and productivity. We need the evidence. Uh, I'm sure everybody around the table uh, under, accepts and understands that point. Um, we've noted of course, that government can't do it all through direction. Um, there's, I said it earlier, I'll say it again, terrible tendency for governments increasing to feel they're required to do everything centrally by direction, and they can't. And I, I enjoyed the contributions about the ability of markets uh, to actually cause change very quickly, um, and indeed, the market has to be used to change things as well as government direction. But of course, by the same token, you have to be very careful uh, that the markets are giving the correct um, incentives and uh, they are correct, in inverted commas, correctly regulated to produce um, an outcome that society wants. I was struck by... Um, the comments about the need the, for, and it's obvious when you say it, for consistency over time, that throughout the piece we're dogged by policy changing so rapidly that the markets will not invest in the things we'd like them to invest in because they can't assess the risks, they can't tolerate the risks when they have assessed them. And the obvious point about need for consistency across jurisdictions, where we have crazy in, in, in inconsistencies across central versus local versus devolved uh, administrations. 
it's a very British thing that think uh, I think that. Um, finally, um, I did raise, but we haven't taken forward the the proposition that there might be something new in personal carbon allowances. If if governments can't bear the idea that prices and taxes are going to guide what people do, then we're left with the notion that um, we'll have to, if we want to do something about carbon, we'll have to ration it in some way and give people an allocation of carbon and then perhaps allow them to trade it. Or, but one way or the other, people have to consume less carbon if there's going to be less carbon um, emitted. And if we can't do it through the market, um, maybe we should look carefully at those kinds of alternatives. Um, so those are my takes from the discussion. Uh, anything anybody wants to add? Or Claire, do you want to wind up for us? Thank you, Stephen. Um, actually, I really would just really want to thank everyone. I mean, completely brilliant discussion. Thank you for your brilliant sharing as ever, Stephen. Um, we're going to have, obviously, in the usual way, we will go away, we will reflect, we will listen back. You know, this will be made available. But we, will, we will take on board what has been discussed today. Um, Stephen, you, you made at the start, of, I think you said it somewhere near the start, This the, you summed it up beautifully. There's, there's the world as it is and the world as we want it to be. And they're not the same. And the, uh, the message that I would like to, to end with really is, is that net zero has got to be our North Star. Whether we like it or not, the clock's ticking. Um, the costs of inaction will greatly outweigh the costs of taking timely action. And then we look at a third of Pakistan was underwater. What, what's the, what is that gonna cost? That you know, Look at last week, Hurricane Ian one of the worst natural disasters in the US. These disasters are going to be happening with increasing ferocity and frequency. Um, that's the backdrop. It's going to get louder and louder. So whatever politicians like to say, this is, this is, this is happening. Um, so I guess, in a way, the, the whole purpose of what we're doing and why we're, we're putting this effort into keeping net zero where it needs to be, right in the center, um, it, it becomes more critical and more urgent by the day. So I, I really think this has been a fantastic discussion, but hopefully the beginning of many more, because I, I see there's, there's so much still, still to do. I'm sorry, I don't know whether anybody else also wants to come in with any final thoughts, but, but I had to come in with that urgency because it's, it's, it's the thing that isn't going to go away. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. This is the moment where it would be very nice to um, have a sandwich and a coffee and a chat <laughs> or even a beer, but we can't. Well, we can have a beer, but not together. <laughs> But so thank you, everybody. You, you, you've behaved uh, beautifully and kept your times. And uh, I hope we've had a good discussion. And um, we look forward to the write-up. Thank you so much. And see you next week, I hope. <laughs>